Hi, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's having a, a great day. Um, very excited to be joining all of you today, uh, where we'll be going through our partnership with the GitHub Oxfordship uh, program. So for a bit of an overview, we'll first be going through broadly why Ivy and a bit about why we're building what we're building. Uh, we'll then talk a bit about the application process overall uh, before then going through a live demo of working on one of the tasks um, and then also yeah, meet some of the team and, and leave lots of time for questions at the end as well, basically. Um, so I think my screen is sharing. Um, let me just double check that that's the case because uh, I have my screen share here. Um, but yeah, there we go. It is amazing. So um, yes, so we're going through auction ships with Ivy. So again, as I said, to start off with, we'll go through yeah, why Ivy, the application process, um, a coding challenge live demo. We'll then hear from our team and have time for questions at the end. Um, the other thing I want to quickly say is that it's uh, amazing to see so much excitement in the comments already. Uh, really amazing to be with all of you. Uh, and you're yeah, very excited to see so much enthusiasm. So um, yeah, and obviously you save your questions. We'll make sure to answer. Um, all of them as we go through. Um, OK, so starting out, again, we'll start out with a bit of a high level view. Um, and then as we go through, just to first of all, try to motivate you know, why we're building what we're building in the first place, um, just to set the context of what you'll be working on uh, throughout the internship. Uh, and then, yeah, and then we'll get into more of the details specific to Octonship. Um, so without further ado, let, let's first look at the machine learning landscape. So the first thing that exists. So AI, first of all, has advanced tremendously. All of us know that you know AI is used everywhere. It's used in chatbots. It's used in analytics and so on. But the first problem is that this has occurred across a myriad of incompatible machine learning frameworks. Many of these you might recognize. There's things like TensorFlow used massively in production. PyTorch, obviously very popular. But also there's things like Scikit-Learn, Pandas using data analytics and so on. So there's a lot of innovation happening across a lot of different frameworks. If we then roll this up and look one level lower, you'll see that there are also a lot of different competing compiler toolchain technologies, which again, are also not um, compatible with each other. Then we look one level further low, lower again, and we see this myriad of incompatible hardware, which again, um, again, all of these aren't totally interoperable with each other. And if we zoom out a bit further, what we notice is that not all of the frameworks, infrastructure, and hardware are densely connected. They are, in fact, sparsely connected, such that not everything in the stack connects to everything else. What that means is when you have a particular framework that you're using, you do not have access to all of the cutting edge technology that you could have access to under the hood, because not everything integrates with everything else. And this is a problem when it comes to running things efficiently particularly if you want to be running this to your end users, who then obviously expect to have you know, high runtime run performance, you have your model. And as we, look, as we look, when you then go down from your model and you then actually deploy this on some particular compiler infrastructure and on some particular hardware, as we said, not everything is available. So you inevitably need to you know, just use what's there. And this often isn't as good as it could be. And you then end up not running things efficiently as you otherwise could be doing. So this is the first problem when it comes to deployment. If we go up the stack a bit again, we see that lots of amazing um, AI tools have built on top of this stack as well. Um, again, the problem here is that um, there is not one framework being used for everything. And therefore, you need to re-implement things across frameworks. For example, taking one example in Hug and Face, they recently re-implemented Whisper in JAX and got a 70 times speed up by virtue of um, XLA, by virtue of TPUs, batchifying, uh, and so on. So you then need to have, you know, PyTorch is an incredibly extensible language, JAX is incredibly efficient, but you end up then needing to re-implement things across these frameworks, which is, which is not ideal. Um, now to say that this causes the entire um, stack to spontaneously combust is perhaps, um, perhaps a slight exaggeration, um, but it's certainly not sustainable to have all of this fragmentation across all levels of the stack. So you might just be thinking, first of all, well, that's all well and good, but isn't PyTorch the only thing that matters today? Um, and it's certainly true that PyTorch is used massively in, um, in research and is, is the dominant framework for large language models. But in our view, which is perhaps a controversial view, AI is still bigger than just, just chatbots. There's still a lot more going on um, across the world of AI. Um, and when you look at industries and research, there is still deep fragmentation. First of all, we have tools massively used such as Scikit-Learn, Pandas, and NumPy for things like finance and business, business analytics. We have tools like 
um, or frameworks I or languages, I should say, uh, like Julia, use massively at things for things like uh, physics research, um, at CERN, NASA, etc. Again, Julia is an, is an incredibly high performance language and has a lot of applications in numerical simulation and so on. Uh, TensorFlow remains very strong when it comes to deploying to edge devices and mobile devices. Um, it still has superior deployment features than, than a framework like PyTorch and is used massively in industry. We have MATLAB, for example, that's used massively in engineering. In fact, everyone that goes to engineering school like I did will know that one of the first coding experiences you get is with MATLAB and it's still used massively um, even for neural networks with things like the, the neural network toolbox, et cetera. I um, mean, then we have Jax obviously used at um, DeepMind and using Google and high performance uh, programming, especially on TPUs. And then if we look at, you know, Chinese universities, there's a lot of use of Paddle Paddle and MindSport, et cetera. And of course, PyTorch used in academia and research. So you have all of these different frameworks, um, none of which are compatible, none of which you can plug thing, you know, take things off the shelf and integrate them together into projects. And this is one of the problems that the ID is looking to solve. And if we look at the stack in a bit more detail, I won't unpack all of this because there's quite a lot, lot of technical content. But the takeaway is um, that there are like sprinkles of unification in this fragmented stack, but they're few and far between and nothing has really brought all of these together in a really intuitive, simple way for the end user. So at the top, there are things like the API standards, like, um, like the Array API standard from Quantsight. There are framework wrappers like um, Tensely, Neuropod, Think, Keras now reintroducing this space as, again, EgoPy, et cetera. Um, but these don't enable you to mix and match between frameworks like Ivy does. They just enable you to write code that's agnostic, but not mix and match pre-existing code, which is what Ivy adds to this. There's then the actual frameworks themselves, which are, of course, fragmented, all these disjointed, non-consistent APIs for building things and doing things. There's then graph traces to actually extract directed acyclic graphs from this arbitrary Python code. Um, there's then exchange formats, which are predominantly looking to enable unification purely for deployment. The idea being that you write this to a file representation that then can be deployed across hardware. There's various compiler infrastructure, which is um, trying to unify things. MLIR is a great piece of technology. Modular building on this with the Mojo language, Apache TVM and OctroML, again, the company related to that technology. Um, so yeah, unif unification attempts again when it comes to deployment infrastructure. And then we go down and we again get um, fragmentation with the vendor specific APIs and vendor specific compilers and so on. So you have elements of unification, elements of fragmentation, but what Ivy is trying to do is right at the top of this stack, bring all of this technology to the end user in the most simple and intuitive way possible where they only need to add one line of code and their project, whatever it might look like, instantly has access to all of this technology. And this is really what we're trying to do. So again, so the question is, why is the stack still a mess? Um, and, and you know, for lots of reasons, this can be looked for lots of reasons, but in our view, this, is, this can be boiled down to three. First of all, you can't expect everyone involved in any field, but especially machine learning, to suddenly build around your new standards. So building a great piece of technology and assuming that everything else you know, stops is, is wrong. A best case scenario, many people will adopt your standard, but several still won't. Um, and then if other competing standards exist, the fragmentation problem will remain. So how are we trying to overcome some of these, some of these problems? So we're taking a, a somewhat different approach whereby, first of all, we proactively bind to everything else that's out there. We don't need external consensus or external efforts, really. We, we very much just accept that things are fragmented and that we want to be the glue that connects them and we do the work to make sure that they're all you know, coexisting and, and reach them at their own technology and we don't expect people to come to us. Um, so this is kind of well encapsulated by this image where we have Ivy connecting to the frameworks. We proactively connect with our own MLIR dialect. We um, build connections to things like OpenAI Triton, TensorRT, various hardware vendors and their own APIs as well, Onyx, um, XLA, Mojo, et cetera. So we want to be the glue that just does the work of making all these things have you know, a joint connection that brings these things together. So the second point is that we use existing standards. We don't create new ones. We're doing everything based on the array API standard by Quantsight and where the functions aren't covered by those we're adopting and adhering to Onyx as much as we can. So we're not trying to create a new thing. You know, we're really doing the best to, to adopt to what has been ex accepted as the standard for this, um, these intermediate layers. 
it's totally complementary. So there's no need for any user to jump ship. And basically, we want to make existing stacks still thrive. And we just add ourselves as one line. And everything can stay as, as it is. And we just make the, the situation better. We don't try to overtake or own the entire stack. And it only requires one line of code. Really an extension of this third point. Again, we're not trying to own the entire stack. We're trying to just give you new superpowers. And all you need to do is add one important one line of code to, to get them. Oh, and there's also, yeah. And we were built on a high level mathematical intermediate representation which we see as being universal and, and it's a fundamental part of, of machine learning. Machine learning is built upon linear algebra and fundamental mathematics and our intermediate representation is at the level of array processing functions, which are, um, you know, which are here to stay. Maybe at some point in the future, things become entirely bio-inspired and asynchronous and there's no such thing as a matrix anymore, but I don't think that's happening anytime soon. While you know, while things are based on arrays and tensors and stuff, then this IR remains relevant, and and that's what we're building around. And you know, much more timeless, because things haven't changed since NumPy two thousand six. Really, the array API broadly is the same. It's got MATML, element wise addition, etc., um, and it's not changed in twenty years. Um, and this is what we're building around, basically. So a few points on how it works. So first of all, um, there is the ability to build. Um, universally. So let, let's assume, well, let's let's take the example of the IV vision library. This is a library that we've built entirely in IV, in IV, the machine learning framework. The, the benefit of this library is that it instantly supports all versions of all frameworks. So in this example, we're using on line 15, we're using the IV vision library um, in a TensorFlow model. But similarly, you could use this in a PyTorch model or in a JAX model, or in any model. So the ability to write code that transcends frameworks is the first strength that you get with Ivy. And then we have this ability to experiment effortlessly. And this is not about writing new Ivy code. It's about taking existing code and still making it compatible across frameworks. So in this case, you're using TensorFlow because it's got good deployment features. You can run it on a mobile phone. There's all kinds of good reasons to use TensorFlow. But you would like to use the Cornea library, which is a very popular um, computer vision library written in PyTorch. And of course, you can't use it in TensorFlow today. Well, now with Ivy, you can. With one line of code, you can get the entire library transpiled so that it behaves exactly as the original library, the only difference being now it works directly in a TensorFlow project. The same is true for um, the same is true for models. So you can take um, some encoder, let's say from DeepMind written in Jack's Haiku, you can then transpile this and use it in a PyTorch model that you've built. Maybe you've built a custom PyTorch model, but you want the backbone to be based on you know some cutting edge DeepMind architecture. And with one with one line of code, you can bring this into your project, train your PyTorch model in you know PyTorch Lightning or whatever you want to do. But you've still got this JAX model with one line of code. So this is how Ivy enables people to experiment effortlessly across the boundaries of their frameworks. And then the final one is deploy instantly. And in fact, they should probably say deploy efficiently and cheaply, because not only can you deploy with one line of code, but you can do so while unlocking all of the untapped potential in this stack, getting cheaper, faster, more accurate, and more efficient um, runtime. And we'll have more results on this exact, uh, on these um, deployment solutions um, in the next few weeks as we start rolling some blog posts out on this as well. Um, so that's what Ivy looks like in a nutshell. And, and, and by doing all of these things, we're, we're, we're striving to unify all levels of the fragmented stack such that builders can build more easily, more flexibly, and people develop, uh, developing and deploying these models can do so more cheaply and um, you know, more, more quickly and more efficiently and so on. So really by unifying all of these disconnected islands, everybody in the field of AI stands to benefit massively from this. So that's a bit of a motivation for why IV. It's quite high level, but hopefully I give you a bit of a sense about what we're all about, what we're doing, and, and what you will be working towards um, if, if you end up doing an internship slash internship with us. Um, so now I'll, I'll hand over to Arsh, who can talk a little bit about the application process itself. We've got this big, beautiful image uh, for you to kind of get a high level view, somewhat high level view of, of the process. So yeah, I've really found the thing. So yeah, go ahead, Arsh. Yep, thanks, Dan. So hello, everyone. I am Arsh, uh, one of the engineers working here at Ivy. So I, uh, in this slide, we'll be going through the exact process of the, of the, of the IV application, which you'll be making through GitHub. So first things first, obviously, you need to do uh, some prerequisites. That is, you need to check if you meet the requirements to apply to the GitHub internship. 
of course it's available on the on the website and then in the end just apply as a student on the octonship website now once you've made an application and chosen ivy as one of the projects you want to contribute to the first step that that uh, we uh, we introduce to assess you is our open source coding challenge so basically what you need to do is obviously clone the repository locally and then go through the open tasks in the contributing section of the docs and this is this is uh, this is available on our website and it it has a doc subsection where in where in you'll find the the contributing section um uh, just uh, in the in the first few subsections of the docs so there we have a couple of uh, open tasks listed out uh, listed out for contributors that that they can obviously make couple requests to and once you finally um, finalized which task you you're planning to do we have all of these in a form of to-do list issues on our github repository so you pick a pick a task in in this case so so basically uh, talk, talking about the open tasks currently we have adding a few front end functions um, uh, open front end functions then we have some reformatting tasks that are still open to contributors and at last you, you can also fix a failing test if you, if you want to get get to an intermediate level of contributing so you pick a function from the to do list issue assign yourself to that uh, to that issue by creating a new issue and mentioning the issue number of course then comes the real deal you start to implement the function in the current in the correct file so for example if it's a front end function this is how the folder structure looks inside the ivy repository you go to ivy then um, the main repository has an ivy folder then you go to functional then the front ends and then inside you'll you'll go to the exact uh, framework that you want the, that you're implementing the function for so let's say if it's a paddle paddle uh, function which obviously ved will be de demonstrating in the lights further you you'll go to ivy functional ivy front uh, ivy um, functional front ends then paddle paddle and then the exact function you're implementing once you're done with implementing the function we need you to write a test for it because testing is very important and all of our functions and all of our classes are tested across all sorts of possible inputs so the so the 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 testing uh, strategy that we use here at ivy is property based testing we use a library called hypothesis and uh, we facilitate tests through pytest so uh, and th th that's why the that's why i've written that you approximately need 3 hours because you you'll definitely need to dive a little deeper into what hypothesis is and how you test for the parameters for your function at last you make a pull request and wait for a review and so someone from the team will probably get back to you within within a week or so now that you're done with the coding challenge the next part of the uh, the, the process is iv roadmap video answers so here what we want you to do is to go through the 10 video questions that we present in front of you and with each one having a 1 minute recording limit and the questions will basically be on ivy's long term roadmap our challenges ahead and what you feel lacks in our design basically and this is this is not and all of this information can be found in our docs again so going through the subsections of this broader um, roadmap video answers uh, uh, task is firstly you go through the user section of the docs wherein we explain our motivation like i think we've lost i think we've lost ash <laughs> i can maybe pick up until ash is back uh, maybe he's had a local internet problem um where where were we actually so i was answering some questions on youtube so i, I lost track a bit well where, ash is back i will let you pick up <laughs> Oh, can can you actually tell me where I got cut off? <laughs> I was trying to remember that myself actually. Uh, go to the go to the user section first. That's where. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Um, my bad, everyone. My, I think my internet connection is not that good. So first thing you need to do is go through the docs, and then um, firstly you will go through the user section of the docs, which briefly explain the motivation behind IV and how we compare to all the other. parties in this open source world who are trying to achieve the similar thing that we are trying to do then you go through the deep dive section of the docs which basically explains our design in depth and here we've included every almost every single line of code there is for the iv framework code base i mean you don't need to dive in very deep for this 
go through the <laughs> compiler and transpiler section of the docs where you basically it's it's just a high level overview of the api which helps you uh, translate code from one framework to another once you're done with this uh, you, you did i get cut off again no keep going briefly but it's also good <laughs> keep going No, it's, it's all good. We can hear you, Ash. We can hear you. Oh no, we can't. I guess it's gone again. Well, uh, let, let me let me let me wrap it up. Uh, I guess the internet yeah. in Ash's house isn't working. I I guess I'll I'll turn my turn my video <laughs> off. Yes. Uh, yeah, maybe that helps. Yeah, no, I think that will work. Uh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So maybe I was to like you go through the transpiler compiler section of the docs, which basically explain our uh, how you convert code from one framework to the to the other. And in the end, you answer the, the 10 questions present in front of you. After you've done this, you may be called with a one-to-one -one interview with someone from, from our team. This will basically be a, a very informal interview wherein you'll get to know each other and probably discuss tasks for the internship and uh, what, what the person himself is working on and what the other people in the team are working on, what, what kind of sub-teams we, we have here. And whether, and also a very important point that uh, this is the talk where we decide if it's a mutual good fit, good fit for each 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 one of us. Also, this is a great chance for you to answer, uh, ask any internship related questions or IV related questions you may have. In the end, fortunately, you once you've done with all the processes, and uh, hopefully we are able to make you an offer. And yeah, that's that's about it for the application pipeline. And I guess I. No. I didn't get cut off too much. You, you gave us a perfect source of comedy, so that's perfect. <laughs> no, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Ash. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, uh, well, then what we'll do now, uh, let's fingers crossed that, that VED's internship, uh, internship, VED, VED's internet uh, holds up. Uh, so we'll now go over to a, a coding challenge live demo. So focusing on a paddle front end and just go through on, on a relatively high level the entire process uh, with, with a screen share on, on um, yeah, getting things set up um, quickly and, and, and making your first um, front-end pull request. Um, so without further ado, I'll stop my screen share and yep. hand over to Ben. Yep, sure. Let me get that shared. I'll also keep, I'm just going to keep doing the uh, answers on, on the questions as well. Right. Um, there we go. Um, is that visible to you? Yeah. Got it. Um, so probably I'll take, take forward from where uh, Arsh kind of uh, reached. So essentially, you go and you find a to-do list issue on our GitHub repository, where we define what the open tasks are. And then from there on, you start working on it. So that's where we're starting. So uh, first of all, uh, there are a number of open tasks which we have. And right now, we'd be focusing on the front-end API open task. You can know more about what front-end APIs are in, the, uh, in, in our docs. So basically, we will be adding a front end for a framework called Paddle Paddle. So Paddle Paddle is a, a Chinese framework which uh, Ivy is supporting. Uh, so we will be adding a front end function for this uh, actual Paddle function so that we can support this function across all of our backends so that you'll be able to run Paddle Paddle dot square error loss, uh, square error cost using NumPy or TensorFlow or Torch or JAX or any, any ML framework without changing the code. So that is basically the objective which we want to achieve. Now, uh, before we get to what exactly this function is about, uh, firstly, I think we should know a bit more about what we have with us uh, to start with. So right now, uh, given the uh, time limit, I think we shouldn't dive deep into the exact details. But for now, imagine a black box, which is Ivy in which you can call iv.square. And when you call iv.square, if your backend is set in TensorFlow, you would run it. Uh, you would uh, execute iv.square using TensorFlow functions. If your backend set is Torch, you would execute iv.square in Torch functions, and so on. So you can set the backend to anything. And this line remains the same, but it will execute using that particular framework. So this is what we already have with us. And this is what you will have with you when you're starting off with an open task. So this is the IV API, which you have. Now, if we want to implement a front-end function, the goal, as I said, the thing which we want to implement is this function, 
parallel.n.functional.loss.squareerrorloss. I'm uh, taking the full namespace uh, name on purpose, which we'll find about later. And the way in which we want to use it is that we want to add a replica of that function inside our front-end API. So we want to add something like, we want to add the same function inside our Paddle front-ends. So inside Ivy, you have uh, front-ends. So we want to, inside the Paddle front-end, we want to add an exact replica of this function. And the replica, uh, the goal is essentially that, now this is an example which I've directly copied from uh, their page. So the goal here is that whether you import Paddle or whether you import iv.functional.frontends.paddle as Paddle, regardless of whether which import you're using, this function's behavior should essentially be the same. The mathematical operations which are performed and the result which you get out of it, th that should be the same. And that is the goal which we uh, have set, out, uh, set ourselves. Like if you're working on a front-end task, that is the objective you're trying to achieve. So before getting into the actual implementation, the first step ideally is to understand what that function is about. Because uh, right now for demonstration purposes, I've picked a relatively simpler function, but uh, for any kind of function which you are going out to implement, the first goal which you should have for, uh, particularly for a, yeah, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Uh, anything essentially means anything which Dan showed in his slides, which falls under the backend. Um, so inside the, uh, so let's get back to the squared uh, square error cost. So the first goal is to understand what that function is about, because before you try to replicate a function, you should know what that function is exactly doing. Now, this is a very simple function, but for other functions, you might want to uh, kind of know a bit about uh, how that function uh, behaves. And particularly, the best place to look for it is the actual functions documentation. So I've opened the Paddle Paddle documentation for square error cost. And as you can see, this is a very simple uh, equation. You all must know about it already. All we are doing is we are doing an element-wise operation where you have input, you have labels, and you compute the squared difference between the two. And this is what we want to replicate using IV functions so that whenever you set any backend, you will use that particular implementation. So this is the example which we copied from there. Now, for doing that, the first thing which we need to do is like if we want to use this instead of this, we should make sure that inside these, inside our front ends, in the same namespace, you have that function. So you, where to add that function, as Arsh was pointing out, where you need to look into where the function needs to be placed. The first thing you should do, once you know which front end you're entering, uh, adding the function for, is you need to figure out what the namespace is going to be. And we already know that the namespace is nn functional loss and square error cost. So let's go into the file explorer. And what we'll do essentially is inside the parallel front ends, because that's where we are. We'll go inside the parallel front ends. We know we, that we need to go inside NN because that's the namespace. Then we need to go inside functional because that's uh, another namespace. And then we need to go inside loss because that's the file. Now, most of the time you might find the file already being present there, but if it is not, then ideally what you should be doing is you should go to the actual repository. You should try and find where that function is because we want to essentially replicate the exact place where that was added. So we go inside that same file explorer. And from there, we know that there was a file named loss, which contains the function which we want to add. So if loss wasn't exist, uh, if loss.py wasn't existent here, you should ideally be creating one and then, and you'd know which file to create based on how it is structured, because we are essentially trying to replicate everything about those uh, those frameworks we are supporting in the front ends. So when you go and you add that function, so as you know, the function name is essentially the same as this one. The function inputs are also the exact same as the ones uh, in the uh, documentation which we saw. And then we are doing, uh, we are adding the implementation for it. Now, this is just a mathematical representation of what we need, because that's what, how you compute squared error. Now, there are a couple of decorators which are added on top of it. And for now, you can just assume uh, that the first decorator you're seeing, the two IV arrays and back decorator, is essentially converting 
a front end tensor to an iv tensor so a tensor which will be accepted by the paddle front end contains an iv array in it and we are extracting that iv array out of it using this decorator we won't go into the details of how exactly it is working but for now i'd say let's assume that because this decorator essentially enables us to use iv uh, functions inside a front end function secondly this is something which uh, you there are two ways to figure this out so what we want to do is we should be able to correctly flag what data types are supported by the function and what data types are not supported by the function so if we go in uh, the first way and this is something which ideally should be the first uh, kind of thought process like the first thing you should try to achieve is like you go through the function doc string itself and you see if there's any indication of whether there's a d type whether there's some mention that this particular d type is uh, uh, supported or not so if we go through this doc string as you can see on this line it is saying that the data type should be float 32 and the same thing exists for label as well that the data type should be float 32 now this function in essentially is stating that only float 32 would be supported by this function so that's what we should also be doing we don't need to support the other d types in that particular front end function so essentially we'd just go here and we'd mark that one d type as supported now in cases where certain d types are mark marked as unsupported you can use with unsupported d types but this is the format in which you let uh, the testing pipeline know that we want uh, that float 32 is the supported d type for a function and we should be testing for that one now inside the implementation all we want to do is we want to replicate the behavior of square error cost which was mentioned here what and essentially we all we have to do is we have to compute a difference and a square so that's exactly what we are doing but as you can see here we are using iv functions and this is the step where you need to do a decent amount of exploration of the iv api itself to find out whether some what you need to implement that function is already present in the iv api or it, it, whether it's not now i knew that subtract is present but if you didn't you can just uh, go through our documentation search for a particular function you want and it would show up in the iv api or otherwise you can just in fact even search through this where you can find out that there's a there's a square function in iv so this square function is guaranteed to return the same result regardless of whether you are setting a tensorflow backend or a torch backend or a jax backend or a numpy backend the backends which we support so you know that subtract is present you also know that square is present so given that both functions are existing our job is pretty straightforward all we have to do is we just need to uh, call them so we are just subtracting the input and the label and we are squaring it to return the result now alternatively just to make things um, a bit more elegant you could in fact also do something like this where you would just return the input minus label and you square that and that would that should also work because iv arrays have uh, we have supported all the operator dunder methods in the iv array so essentially these two are going to end up having the same functions called underneath but for now just uh, for the sake of explainability this is how it's going to work so we subtract the two and we square them and we return the result and we mark something as unsupported or unsupported primarily based on the uh, doc string of the function assuming the doc string is a verbose enough to let us know that something is unsupported now this is done so we essentially know that we have implemented some function which we think repl uh, replicates the behavior of the original function but we need to write the test for it now because we need to uh, kind of guarantee that this function will return the same result as the original one regardless of what backend is set so for us the ground truth which we'll compare our results again against will be the original function so we'll compare the results we get from this function against the result we get from this front end and every time we use this front end which is calling iv functions we'll set different backends to see that every backend is returning a consistent result against whatever our ground truth we have specified above and that is uh, exactly what our tests are going to do now uh, arsh mentioned a point about hypothesis and i'll get to that but before that we need to figure out where we need to add the tests so if you see the file path here this is something which you should refer to find where you need to add the test so as we can see we are adding the so the everything about iv is present in the iv folder 
and all the tests are present in the IV test folder. So that's the first thing we are going to do is we are going to go inside IV tests. Then we want to test IV and then we want to test the front ends because there's number of files we want to test for the front ends as you can see here. So we go inside the front ends, we go inside, to, we want to test paddle. So we go inside paddle. We want to test NN. So we go inside NN. Then we want to test functional and then we want to test loss. And this is where we will add the tests for the function which we were uh, function which we've just added. So the name of the function, as most of you know, for PyTest to recognize that as uh, a test, we need to just proceed. We we just need to kind of uh, up add a test at the beginning of that function, and this is necessary. Like specifying paddle is necessary in the test because that helps us distinguish IV tests from front end tests. So this is how we'll define like the test. Like this is our this is the function which will be testing whatever function we've added here. So the first thing is that hypothesis is a way to test uh, functions in an in a very exhaustive manner. So one way uh, which most of us are aware of testing functions is where we prepare a bunch of test cases, four or five test cases, and we just test our function against those test cases. Or you could prepare more test cases than that. But in order to be able to exhaustively test, you should open the possibility where you specify a domain or a range of values every parameter could take. And then you allow a library to just explore all possible examples uh, strategically to decide which example should be tested. And in that way, you will exhaustively test regardless of whether you've specified a, a specific example or not. So rather than specifying a few test cases, you just pass it a range and let hypothesis decide what examples it want to, wants to test with. So hypothesis would maintain a cache and it would test those examples. Now to make it easier for you to add the function, we've added some decorators which make things easier for you to implement things, uh, implement the test. So this decorator, the handle front end test decorator is the one which is particularly used when you're adding front end tests for front end functions. There's another decorator if you're adding a method, but we won't go, be going into that. Um, the first parameter for the uh, front end test decorator is the function tree. And what this essentially means is we'll be passing the namespace, which will be used by, uh, our, by our tests to figure out the function wherever that is. This is a way to generate the example. So this, is, this would help hypothesis just edit. we will tell hypothesis what the domain of our examples is going to be what is the range of those values so first of all we know that we want to test with float d, float d types as we seen as we've seen here obviously we could specify float 32 or, uh, directly but to simplify things for you you can just use this or you can just use get d types float and given that we've already added the decorator the test will only test with float 32 and obviously we want to generate two arrays because we want to uh, generate an array for input and an array for label. Then we get inside the test. These are certain parameters which you'll find more explanations in the docs. Probably we wouldn't dive into that uh, as much right now. But basically, it is the front end you want to test against the back end you want to test. And these two are the ones which we already generated. And test flags contain certain configuration flags uh, with which the test should be run with. Uh, so as you've seen, initially, we are generating two arrays. So we get the D types and we get the arrays. Then we separate out the input and the label from the, uh, the one which was generated. And then we pass it to our test front end function. And this function will internally compare the result which you got from original function, paddle dot, uh, nn dot functional dot uh, square, square, error, square error cost. It will compare that against the result which we get using our front end, i.e. this one. Uh, against all the backends which are available to us. So it will test it with all, all of the backends, it will compare the results. Uh, so once we've done that, uh, there is, there's other factors to this, like, but we won't be diving into those. Like you can limit the domain in which data is generated through safety factors. You can uh, limit the uh, tolerance of the comparison, which should be done at the end using relative or absolute tolerances. But just to keep things simple, this is what we'll be doing. We'll be passing the D types. We'll be passing the backend which we want to test. We'll be passing the front end which we want to test. The configuration flags which we got from the de decorator. The function tree to tell our helper to 
or to help it to find the particular namespace where the function exists in the original framework and in our front end, the input and the label, which are the arguments for the function. And essentially, if there were other arguments to whatever function we were testing, we would just uh, kind of add those as well uh, after this is done. And this is how we will add the test. Now, just to keep things simple, I'm running the test through the terminal. However, there are there's better ways to test it based on whatever IDE you're on. Uh, obviously, in order to set up on different environments, all you need to do is uh, go through our setting up guide. You'll know how to set up on VS Code, PyCharm, Code Spaces, so on. Uh, but right now, I'll just be uh, running the test for this function. So as you can see, all I'm doing is I'm passing the path and I'm passing the function I want to test. And these are just flags to ensure uh, that we don't have a lot of um, kind of additional logs which we don't need right now. Uh, this is to specify that we want to test with all the backends. And this is just to uh, just for me to show you that the, how the examples have been generated. So let's now uh, run the, the test. And it takes a bit of time to start. But then uh, there's a lot of configuration uh, from PyTest, which uh, is printed here. And these are the things which we have added in our own, our own uh, conf test. So yeah, here we go. So as you can see, in every test, we are seeing a certain input label being generated with different kinds of values, which have no bounds in the sense that we have only specified the range in which values should be generated. And we are letting Hypothesis decide what values it wants to test. And essentially, that's how we are generating all of these values. And every time a value is generated and these configuration flags are present, we pass it to the test front-end function and it will test the ground truth, i.e. the original function, against our front-end implementation again, with respect to a particular backend that was set. So right now, we are testing the front -end, Pradle front-end against the actual Pradle uh, framework with the NumPy backend because the fun IV functions use used inside it are using the NumPy backend. And essentially, that's how the NumPy test happened. Then we tested with the JAX backend. Then we tested with uh, Torch. We also tested with TensorFlow. And once we tested with all of these uh, frameworks, obviously, we will also test with Paddle because Paddle is a valid backend in IV itself. So we tested with all of that. And obviously, right now, the tests are passing. But uh, in case the tests fail, which is likely to happen, you don't need to worry a lot. Uh, someone from the engineering team is assigned to every pull request you create. So you can just make the changes as per as, uh, like as per what you understand. Just create a PR, link it to your issue, and your assignee will help you uh, figure out all of these uh, things and get it ironed out uh, with the changes. So you don't need to worry about, uh, you don't need to worry about knowing everything about IV or being the Oracle before you start implementing, but you just need to uh, dive into some of the basics about what the function is about so that you can at least know what you're expected uh, expected to do. So yeah, that's all I had. I think that's probably the best explanation there's ever been of a front-end implementation. I think we can re remove the whole front-end deep dive and just replace it with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome, yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Ved. Uh, well, I'll quickly share my screen again, so uh, where were we? And then what we'll actually do next is, is go through um, yeah, well, while meeting the team, probably should have done this at the beginning, actually, in retrospect. Um, a bit strange maybe to wait this long before kind of hearing from the team, but, uh, but let's kick off. Well, actually, Ved, maybe. So so first of all, what we'll do now is just kind of go through, uh, you know, talk about the experience, when people joined, what it was like at the beginning, how the role has unfolded, just to get a bit of a sense of of what it's like to work at IVE. And we'll go through Ved, then, then Arsh, and then Alex as well, who you can hear from as well. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you want to say a few words, Ved. Yep. Um, so as I, I was the one who was speaking before, so I'm Dave Um I've, I joined IV in April last year, and I've been working there ever since. Ever, working here ever since. Uh, currently, I lead the framework team at IV. Uh, in terms of framework, it means the functional API, which we saw right now, then the stateful API modules, optimizers, et cetera, then uh, versioning to support different versions of different frameworks and so on. Uh, so there's a number of such uh, things which uh, come under the IV framework, and that's the team I'm leading. Um, then I have had a really good experience, uh, of course, uh, over the time I've worked here. Uh, you don't have to say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, so, so the first thing which I've experienced, which is very different from the previous, uh, like very different in the sense that, which is very unique in terms of what I've heard from people, other people working at different places, because uh, the first thing which I 
that's unique is like everyone is very helpful in the team itself because uh you know you can literally reach out to anyone on the team at uh, any potential rank and no one is actually uh, entitled to that particular rank they'll just be willing to help you uh, wherever you come across an issue uh, that includes dan that includes anyone uh, ev- um, in the team essentially so that is the most important thing where you are not limited to having uh, to only be able to reach out to one particular person assigned to yourself you can reach out to the whole team at any point in time and you will get help wherever you need secondly the flexible working hours obviously because the the whole work is happens fully remotely so as a result of that you obviously working hours are very flexible uh, thirdly as i mentioned pre- pre- previously that is what that is an essential part of work uh, of a work culture at a particular uh, at a at an organization where you know that you are not working in isolation on something like it's not as if you have a task and you need to just uh, work on it yourself you are actually working with others on that task even if they are not directly involved you can literally reach out to them they'll help you out you can get back to your work and you can do something else and that is uh, another thing which i like finally obviously there's also the flexibility of working in any part of the company at any point in time uh, because you there are essentially a ton of teams which uh, operate across different parts of the whole company and based on whatever task you've picked up on to work on you can work on that particular task regardless of what team that is you can literally pick up the task for that team you can reach out to that team lead or uh, anyone any author of that task you can literally work on that and you're essentially a part of that team now so that is uh, essentially something which uh, i really uh, liked so yeah you're muted then uh, can't hear you sorry i said <laughs> thank you i said well first of all i said thanks bet and i'll also give you a break from talking now <laughs> um yeah so uh, ash do you want to go yeah hopefully my internet's fine this time uh, <laughs> let's, so, let's see uh, hi everyone once again i'm arsh i've been working at ie for almost the same time as uh, ved it's been uh, uh, even i joined in april and i basically work alongside uh, a lot of teams at least currently um so uh, i sub lead uh, testing and one of the deployment sub teams sub- where we were trying to add apache tvm and also i work with uh, ved on the framework side so when talking about experience i'll obviously talk about all the points that ved mentioned but uh, one one thing i'd like to particularly uh, focus on is the level of cross collaboration among teams so let's say you're in the testing te- testing team you'll obviously be collaborating a lot with the ci team because you need to take that uh, take the local setup to the cloud setup and of course you can hit anyone in the team at any point in time with any question you want ved still is my go to for almost any doubt i have <laughs> across the framework so uh, yes his explanations are always seamless and not just with even dan and almost anyone apart apart from their rank everyone is uh, ready to hop on a call and maybe give give a deep dive like this um, any point in time and the the, the second uh, most important point i'd like to highlight here which i forgot to mention in the slide is the promotion of ideas so a, so a particular week for iv team looks like this right so we have a, a couple of sub team meetings but we also have a ton of design decision related meetings so there uh, all of us join and we make uh, we we do a couple of uh, design decision uh, design brain brainstorms across all the sub teams of iv so let's say it's framework or deployment or compiler and th- th- those are basically the, the the best points wherein you can get, you get to interact with the team and share ideas on where you can develop so Uh, the all the scary decorators um, maybe not not scary enough that we uh, went, went through right now actually uh, they, they they were spawned from a very uh, long de- decision de- design decision phase that the testing team had and even now we are trying to optimize on those decorators to get the utmost performance with hypothesis and pytest apart from this there's also de- 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 design decisions being made around the framework and the deployment side as well also we have internal um upskilling sort of meetings wherein we we sort of uh, 
talk about whatever skill we have and then how it relates to the sub team and even that that's a great level of collaboration and uh, yeah basically it you're not confined to one team when you want to work on tasks you can work across tasks so you you can work on the docs you can work on the funding side of the team you can work with the sales team you can work with the testing team you can work with the framework team etc etc so yeah uh, overall my experience has been great and yeah handing over back to you dan thanks awesome thanks ash um okay so then also again apologies for not doing this earlier in the meeting might have made more sense at the beginning but now handing over to um alexandra who who joined us more recently uh, so maybe do you want to say a few yeah a few words on your experience so far uh, alexandra yeah no that's all right hi guys so i'm alexandra posta so i've basically been in your situation three months ago. So I'm quite new to the team. Uh, I've just joined last month, basically. So I've been through the same application process, uh, joined the Discord channel as well. That's very helpful. So I would definitely recommend that to everyone. And basically just to receive the support needed, basically, to do the coding challenge. I know it can be a bit scary at the beginning, especially when it's the first time when you're accessing the code. But actually, the docs are very well laid out. So all of the information needed is there. At the same time on Discord, all of the engineers from Ivy are there on the channels. So normally, if you put a message, you can even receive a response within one hour, which I found extremely surprising. I didn't expect to receive that much support, basically, for my issues. Um, and then, yeah, went through the steps, had the, the video interviews, then the actual interview, got in the team. Um, and the experience was very nice as well. So in the first week, for example, you get to meet all of the teams that um, exist in Ivy. And I personally found deployment and graph compiler very exciting. So at the moment, I'm taking, let's say, most of my tasks from deployment. So again, this was my personal choice, uh, which is quite nice, something different that uh, than you see in other companies, basically, you get this flexibility, let's say, to to choose a certain team that you want to work on and then take tasks from other teams as well. So this is my situation at the moment. So I'm mostly working with deployment, basically looking at some engines, uh, some new engines to include basically in our uh, deployment backend. Uh, and then I'm taking some tasks from graph compiler as well, just because I find it interesting. So something that I see in Ivy def different to other companies that I work for as well. Uh, is how much trust you get as well. Just the fact that it's not like you're working with, it, let's say, a bigger company. You have a lot of restrictions. You can't even create the branch uh, to to start your task. So you can kind of, you know, get hold of your task and get on. Just, um, you know, work on it on your own time, at your own pace. Ask for uh, members of the team, which maybe have a superior rank to you, just to give you a hand with that. So that is quite important. And I do feel like I can make, an impact basically on the team. And that's really important because in a sense, you know, you're working for yourself as well, not just for the company. So, you know, you're getting a lot of new uh, information while you're working on the task. So you can learn a lot. And also we have these amazing deep dives as well. So you can just join, for example, we had even a marketing deep dive as well, uh, which for example, it's not really related to what I do every day for the company, but I've learned something new within one hour. So it's quite nice that you get to uh, evolve yourself while uh, contributing to the team. Um, but yeah, I'm here for any questions, especially for the new applicants. I've been there three months ago. It's fun, guys. And the, and the coding challenges are, are nice. Um, but yeah, good luck to everyone. Uh, thank you, Dan. Amazing. Thanks so much, uh, Alex. Um, so um, yeah, so I think now that with five minutes left, sorry, we I think we all all kind of went over. Uh, I went over quite a bit at the beginning, uh, but but plenty of time for any follow-on questions now as well. Uh, quickly, also just to say that this link, I think it'll be added to the description probably of the YouTube video. Um, and also, obviously, just you know, it's here on the screen. Um, w we can answer any questions specifically about the applications for the Octo and Ship. Um, for, for those that, for example are not in countries which are supported by the Octonship and so on, then of course we do have our, our internships and, and you know, general roles to apply to as well. Um, and, and you can find those, I mean, you can find everything on unify.ai um, and you can then scroll down to careers and, and find the, the link for that and everything as well. I think it's unify.apply.ai if I'm not wrong uh, for that, but, but yeah, you'll find it on our main uh, website. Um, so yeah, any 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 questions? I'm, we've been answering them as we go through, of course. Um, so there's one here already. So um, Alex, for you. So 
can you share a bit about your interview experience? Although I, I would caveat that with maybe no technical details, <laughs> but feel free to share um, yeah, a bit no. about, the, about the experience. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's all right. So uh, I basically had it be one of the engineers from Ivy. So I had it with somebody that's currently working the team. So it was quite useful, let's say, for the end of the interview as well, when I had a few more questions about the code base and just how the team operates. So they were able to give me all of the details. So it was very useful for me, basically, to learn about the team, see if it's fitted for me as well, not just if I'm fitted for the team. Um, and no, it was, it was very enjoyable. Um, around uh, 45 minutes we went over that a bit if i remember correctly but basically yeah nice introduction let's say gentle just to uh, uh for the interviewer to get to know me a bit and my experience and then some technical questions based on ivy basically so it's quite important to go to the docs and just be aware of uh, what's going on in the in the code base yeah no, exactly and also i can, I can say that exactly exactly just to add on to that in terms of the interview style it's um uh, yeah, technical interview. It's not coding. You're not actually like writing the entire algorithm out. It's kind of technical, um, but all done verbally, but like, you know, presentations, some images, some case studies, what should be done here, what should be done here, um, with quite a, a focus on them, the more technical aspects of Ivy, let's say. Um, but but there's the, we give, if you're selected for an interview, if you're selected for an interview ahead of time, you get more details on what the interview will be about specifically. And you're also then free to choose your own interview slot. So there's no kind of real time pressure, you can spend your time preparing and get the interview aligned in your own um, convenience, basically. Um, yeah, any other questions anyone has at all? Um, I see a few comments. So, well, but yeah, thanks, Moses. Uh, the, I'm glad the office hours are informative. Um, Moses is one of our great um, contributors. Um, and um, I am the Kappa AI bot in the dot really helps. It's great to hear. Yeah, the Kappa AI uh, widget is super helpful, for sure, even for you know people internally as well, to be honest. Um, yeah, lots of praise for Ved. Well deserved. Uh, that demo was awesome from Peter. Uh, I was a great idea. Any solutions? Much needed. Good work. Um, there was someone asking actually me. I actually I answered this via the the account on the chat, but but um, silenced spec asking, would you recommend implementing a complex operation in the front end? Like if there is an, an unfold layer in IV, um, thought they might need um, might need to write lots of operations for it. You can do uh, one thing just to say here is that the coding challenge itself is typically not strongly assessed. In the case of the Octone ships, it, it's obviously this part of the phases is assessed a little bit, but but actually we, we see getting this pull request merged as more of an entry barrier. It, it's it's, a, it's, a, it's a, something that everybody has to cross. It demonstrates a base level of familiarity with open source, with testing and so on. Um, and once you've crossed that barrier, it demonstrates to us a certain skill set. But, but because every function is different, and some people do spend you know, less time on easier functions or more time on harder functions. We, try, we don't try to pit these against each other. We really kind of treat our, all applicants as equal once they get past that phase. And then it's about the video, it's about the interview, it's about everything that follows that basically. Um, yeah, but it's, a good, it's also a good opportunity for applicants to actually get a bit of a feel about what the work will be like because implementing a front-end function and getting it merged it is a pretty, pretty good reflection of what some of the lower hanging fruit tasks are when working at Ivy. So, um, I got this question, Harish. What's the difference between the Octonship and internship? Um, so you, you you can apply to to to, to both. Um, the the Octonship, in our case at least, is is a little bit more catered towards people earlier on in their in their open source journey. Let's say um, so. So the internship has now the the entry bar has increased over time. Um, is you know it's compensated more. The Octonship uh, it has a low compensation as well. The Octonship is really to, to get people into the loop of, of, of coding and open source and, and will be very heavy on the mentorship side and helping that person along, whereas the internship is just a slightly higher entry bar, basically. I guess that, that's the main difference. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions at all I can answer? I know, well, I know we've just slightly gone over, so maybe we can actually start wrapping up, but I, I would just quickly leave a few seconds. Any final questions? Oh, there's, there's one. Can you show the process of creating the PR from the manipulation part um the um w w so i'll say ask, ask us in the discord and um ask us well thank you very much um uh deep i appreciate it um the full set rules will be open in a few months and the um as far as the process of creating pr and the manipulation part check out the videos on the deep dive i'd also ask us on the discord um but I, but i would say aside from that 
uh, we'll have to leave it there. But it was really lovely to be with everybody today. Uh, thanks so much for all the great questions. Join the Discord. Uh, we'll, we'll constantly reply to all questions that come our way. So we'll get every question answered. Uh, and thanks again to Ved, Arsh, and Alex for their parts uh, today. Thanks a lot for um, GitHub Opternship Program for having us. And yeah, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot. And we'll slowly drift out with the music. <laughs> Bye for now.